Well, good morning, and that inspiring conversation, of course, was uh, due to our inspiring hosts, and I'm particularly grateful to the Carlsberg Foundation and to Fleming Besenbacher, its chairman, uh, for having invited all of us and for having dared inviting me to address the grand challenges of our societies. Now, being an academic, I might resort to uh, the issue of complexity and say that's a very complex thing. Um, having spent about 12 years of my career in more practical duties as a senior foundation officer, I felt I should make it simpler than that and um, ask a very simple question. And that is how all of us can address those challenges. How can the tip of the tail wag the dog? What do I mean by that simple question, which to my mind is at the heart of any strategic thinking in foundations? I do mean that uh, despite the impressive figures that Dr. Bocher just mentioned from the Euphoria project, taking stock of research and innovation grants and investment of European foundations, in almost all countries and in almost all fields that foundations can possibly invest in, they are in a minority position. And it is more normal to describe their position vis-a-vis -vis all the other resources invested in any given field by the range of about 1%. Foundations in aggregate are normally the 1% player, be it in research, be it in culture, be it in social affairs, be it in education. What do I mean by the 1% player? If you put their total spending in relationship to all non-profit spending, and that in turn to all for-profit or all public spending, the foundation sector in aggregate normally is a small player. And that brings up the core strategic question. How can a small player in any given field really make a difference? How can that situation of being a small player really be addressed. I suggest that we address the issue in four steps. I would not come from a Center for Social Investment if I did not burden you with a little bit of thinking on how you can consider your contributions to addressing those grand challenges as an investment, as a social investment. And the other three arguments will then run that I will look at the roles of foundations in society in a little bit of detail. That is primarily a relationship vis-a-vis -vis the state. Dr. Butcher also just mentioned that in looking at the contributions of research and innovation foundations to European societies, their role in the European concept of welfare and the adjustment of that role might be key. And uh, I could not address any issue of strategy without looking into the division of labor between foundations and their partners or any other players they might work with. So I will look into that more narrow focus of strategy. And finally, I'll turn the question around. Of course, we may be in anecdotal evidence and to some extent in systematic evidence, have some, some ideas and some findings on those foundations and foundation programs that have shown to be highly effective. So in some parts of our research, we turned the question around. We looked at programs and activities that were clearly demonstrated to be highly effective in a whole range of evaluation studies. And we then asked the simple question, what are the characteristics of those highly effective programs? What did they do to be as effective as it was demonstrated in evaluation? Now, it's a simple question, but I have to add a little bit of complexity in offering you the squaring of the circle in this graph. I already mentioned, I would like to invite you to think of your contributions to society as investments, as social investments. And in inviting you to do that, I would also suggest that these investments are made in a whole range of different relationships. And this graph is the summary of those relationships. And I would start by mentioning the four corners of the picture. If your foundations invest in their mission and invest in their programs, they are contributing to quite different functions in society. Of course, you're investing financial resources, and in a certain way, this contributes to an economic function. You are providing products or services, or you're allowing for people to be employed, or you're allowing for institutions to conduct their operations, and this, in a certain way, contributes to an economic function. 
But at the same time, you are contributing to the building of networks and trusts in society, which I would describe as the social function. And um, the study, the euphoria study of the EU Commission has obviously just indicated that the, the trust issue, the, the issue of what social scientists, my colleagues in different departments call social capital, are also very important when it comes to what foundations invest in. And in investing economic resources in a context of social trust and social values, you're basically performing a contribution to a cultural function. You are living up to certain values that are driving your own mission and that are driving your own work. And you are trying to share those values with the rest of society and to find allies that in turn share your values and build coalitions, which ultimately brings me to the fourth corner, which is a political function. If you share values with a whole set of other players, and if you think that your values are the f at the forefront of how societal problems should be addressed and can be resolved, this is at least implicitly contributing to a political function. And if you look at the core of the picture, you see that there is a triangle involved in it, which we are commonly referring to as a sector triangle. Um, we are referring to what foundations do as being in reference to the other sectors. And it is common to look at the reference to the public and the market sectors. But at the same time, the third corner in this case is not the non-profit sector to which foundations belong, but it's the sort of the immediate private sector of families and communities to which foundations have a reference. So what would I like to suggest with using this graph? I would like to suggest that what you do has to be positioned in that framework and you do a little bit of one or a little bit of the other simultaneously in your activities. You take a reference to the market, to the state and to the private life worlds of people in whatever you do and this positions your strategy. You have to choose whether you are primarily addressing research and development in a way to ultimately lead to new developments in the market, or whether you are addressing research and development in a way to ultimately enable people to live together in a different way, or whether you are addressing research and development in a way to advocate for and to leave a mark on the political concepts of how we live together. And in the center of the picture you therefore see that depending on how you adjust these relationships, you may be closer to the role of just a non-profit organization. The terminology already indicates those references, the non-profit versus the non-governmental situation or the situation of informal networks and ties in society. Now, of course, everybody can come and make a claim what we are doing is a social investment. How would we test if that claim is really being lived up to? A social investment would be characterized, in my view, by two core criteria. It is made in a voluntary way and it is making a contribution to the public benefit. And that claim to make a contribution to the public benefit, of course, needs to be tested. It will be tested as to its legitimacy, first of all, in terms of the motivation. What is the goal, what is the mission of the investor in making a contribution? But it will also be tested in reference to its results, to its impact. First, the beneficiaries, but also secondly, the society at large will put up these investments for a test whether they're accepted as contributions to the public benefit, the public good, or whether they are seen as self-interested, as perhaps in a conflict of interest, or as not that much at the heart of relevant pressing needs in society. And we should also mention that the way those contributions are made may also play an important role. If you're trying to sort of demonstrate, to foster the values of democracy and your internal decision making does not live up to being responsive and accountable to different stakeholders, you may feel that pressure of legitimacy in terms of the processes which, in which you conduct your operations very directly and you may provoke very critical questions very directly. So in summarizing again, you are making contributions in a voluntary way to the public good 
and you are subject to a test to the acceptance of society at large in terms of whether you're addressing relevant core problems, whether you're really managing to create impactful solutions, and whether the process in which you organize that is accepted as fair. This brings me to the second argument. We need to look into the relationship between those private contributions to the public good and other players. This goes to the heart of what a foundation is. And I would make a claim that we can describe that in a few very simple categories of what is at the heart of your institutions as foundations. You're value-based in whatever way originally set up by the donor of the foundation or by the creators of the foundation. You have to deal with multiple stakeholders, at a minimum with your beneficiaries, with your investment partners, with your staff, with players in the field in which you're in pursuit of your mission. And I would claim being contributors to the public good with the public at large in a democracy. So you always have to be responsive to a multiplicity of stakeholders. And some of the foundations that are not as, um, as, uh, in as happy a position as the Carlsberg Foundation is, or as some of the other major foundations in research as the Wellcome Trust is, that have a very substantial endowment, foundations may also have to deal with a multiplicity of sources of income. They may receive public funding on top of their own resources. They may actually contribute by fundraising or by bringing in the, re the resources that they generate as revenue on their endowment. Irrespective of what values they express, irrespective of what stakeholders they serve and what the sources of their sustainable existence are, uh, Dr. Bozzo spoke of the resilience of foundations, in particular in some European countries in the South or in Central Europe. Irrespective of that, foundations should first of all keep in mind that they're independent private organizations. And that that independence is a very valuable asset that allows the foundation as a self-governed organization to make its contribution and to base its legitimacy both on the freedom of a donor and the freedom of the foundation in consequence to make those contributions and to the claim that the foundations are working effectively and therefore they really live up to their mission. If we look at the relationship between foundations and the state, and by implication, this is frequently done when we speak of research foundations because a strong share of research funding is provided by the state on its different levels. Um, it is worthwhile looking into the role of foundations vis-a-vis -vis the state in a little bit of detail. And you see that this range of categories offered here in the list is the result of empirical work on what roles foundations have actually performed, if you look at them. Frequently, they play a role of complementarity. They serve and otherwise underserved groups, and they serve issues for which uh, the market would not be catering or for which public activities would not be interested for lack of voter turnout, voter success, or for lack of profitability. In some other cases, however, foundations are also either deliberately choosing to or I would say in most cases, carefully avoiding to take a role of substitution. In that role of substitution, they might have to act in lieu of the state. And that is challenging because if you are in that 1% role that I described initially, you should uh, be careful enough to know that your resources will be far too limited to accept any challenge of taking over roles of the state even if there may be political pressure to do so, even if there may be societal pressure to do so. Foundations will, first of all, fail for lack of resources on that account, and they will secondly suffer for lack of independence on that account. A third role that we sometimes find played by foundations is the role of redistribution, but um, our distinguished colleague Ken Pruitt from Columbia in New York um, kept arguing that that role might also be viewed with sort of with care, with caution, 
because um, a lot of resources that foundations actually spend are in turn spent to the same social groups and to issues of the same social groups from which the resources come that foundations enjoy. And so, uh, again, the limitations of their economic situation would not suggest that they could be a strong mechanism of redistribution resources in a way of, a, of a, a increasing social justice. If they want to work for the sake of social justice, it would certainly be not just through their financial resources, it would be through their other roles, which I mention in the next bullet points, which would be through innovation or through social and policy change. Advocating for change and advocating for structural change in the institutions of society, and that could include empowering the otherwise excluded. And we should not forget that foundations are at times and again playing a role of preserving traditions and pres preserving cultural, cultural uh, independence of either particular groups or traditions in society at large. And finally, the core issue that I would suggest is the role of foundations in a democratic society is to contribute to pluralism and to diversity in society. And especially when it comes to social innovation, that role of being the playground for experiments, being the playground for new and diverse approaches to resolve societal problems, may be the core role that foundations could play in line with, and this is why I mark them, especially when you think of your role as a research foundation, in line with your role as uh, an institution driving innovation and social change. That reference to the European welfare model implies that we have to look at the different traditions of that welfare model that vary a good deal depending on which countries you look at. And I only suggest those four basic models to you that have emerged from years of observing foundations in their actual role, and I think those four also describe the vast majority of what foundations do in different parts of the world vis-a-vis -vis their political cultures and their welfare regimes. And I will hint at certain countries that are perhaps the sort of the, the prototypical case of each of those roles and each of those models. The first one is the social democratic model in a highly developed welfare state in which foundations play a role of a very coordinated approach in relationship with the state and in which the state normally coordinates the whole process. And this would be perhaps a description of more like the Swedish model. You, you should be careful, not, not all those countries where perhaps there is a strong social democratic political tradition uh, fit into the same categories, but this description would perhaps be the closest to what you in reality find in Sweden. The state-controlled model is what you in reality have found for a long period of time in France, where foundations until about eight or nine years ago uh, enjoyed or rather suffered from a legal situation in which the state would even have a right, a statutory right, to appoint one third of the board members of the foundations. And as a consequence, the whole concept was not very attractive. Just imagine uh, in a number of Danish cases, the state, the government appointing one third of the board members. And I guess a whole number of those entrepreneurs who took that decision to, to create a foundation would have simply decided otherwise. So they did in France, and only a substantial legal change nine years ago also changed, slowly changed the philanthropic culture which is now emerging, uh, which is now becoming more vibrant. That's the state-controlled model. The corporatist model, I would say, is more like a situation that resembles the German experience. A, a situation in which we claim to use this frequently cited term of subsidiarity. What do we mean by that? We mean by that that a social problem is addressed on the lowest level in the political system possible, which means wherever possible on a local government level, where possible in the next place on a state level, and only where needed on a federal or European level. And in that situation, foundations enjoy a role also legally provided for in which they are complementary players in a regulated environment but using their freedom and using their independence which characterizes them. 
I should mention that in this situation we also have seen a history of a strong share of operating foundations. About one third of our foundations in our country are operating institutions that run activities in their own institutions, primarily in social welfare and in education. So if we speak of the German welfare state, a strong share of what that state provision guarantees in legal terms is actually provided for by non-profit organizations and among them by a strong share of operating foundations that run their own care institutions, their own hospitals, their own education facilities and some of them being very large organizations that employ thousands of employees and that have an annual turnover for their services of several hundred million. That's part of the corporatist model and I don't say too much if I point you to the liberal model, which is the Anglo-Saxon tradition of foundations being truly independent of the state and trying to, to take a rather alternative or non-majoritarian position vis-a-vis -vis the public sector. Now, for research, this may have different implications. The corporatist model would almost call for private universities to be established, which, however, we've only seen in rare instances, and I would argue which still have to demonstrate that they can really survive uh, in a resilient, in an independent way on their own endowments. None of them in our German experience has reached that level of an endowment that would really allow the university to exist without continued grant funding from outside. Vis-a-vis -vis the other different models, you can clearly see that it is an important issue for your strategy development to balance the independence and the complementarity of what you do against what the state does. In terms of the more detailed look at strategy, I would like to suggest that we now close, uh, approach this issue of how the tip of the tail can wag the dog in more detail. We have, I would suggest, four opportunities of how foundations can leverage their impact and they can use references to the different other sectors. They can use leveraging market forces and uh, in many conversations that we have in, uh, in, among colleagues in philanthropy, this is an issue that is best described and illustrated by the development of microfinance, which in the first probably two decades of its existence has been strongly supported by foundations to really manage to get to that threshold at which it would then be able to continue refunded by market forces. We have frequently seen those cases in which foundations have resorted to a political advocacy role or have resorted to a role of advocating for policy changes and some foundations have even taken a very, a very European role and have for many years taken a strong strategy in promoting European integration, promoting at the time when that was at stake the enlargement of the European Union and advocating for corresponding reform processes. Foundations could resort to the forces of civil society, that is to mobilizing civil society organizations, and in the last uh, case this would mean mobilizing people. Mobilizing people in their capacity as citizens, as consumers, as investors. And this shows that these roles can be overlapping. This, is, this list is not exclusive. A foundation strategy may not just do one of them and not do the others. What, they, what a foundation strategy actually does may be overlapping in this regard. And the fourth level would be, and the European Commission study has shown this impressively, foundations might look at the potential, the capacities, the talents of individuals and promote the know-how and the capacities of individuals, which would be the fourth lever. Now, I would like to offer you for, for looking at your strategies in a bit more detail and looking at the division of labor with other organizations in a bit more detail, two metaphorical transfers from, from business admin. This chart is what uh, our colleagues in business admin would call an intensity of production chart. What is it what you do as a foundation vis-a-vis -vis -vis what other players need to do to really get your mission completed and get your mission successfully implemented? If that chart was done on the car industry, the share of the car industry 
and the companies of the car industry themselves would be 29% roughly. Only 29% of the value represented by a new car is actually produced by that company. The rest of it is bought from suppliers and integrated and assembled into the car. If you take that thought, how would that work in your case? What, what do you build your strategy on in terms of preconditions that you need from other organizations to be in place, in terms of knowledge, in terms of conceptual thinking? And what other organizations do you need to implement your strategic approach to, to, to liaise with, to build alliances with, to build coalitions with, to really get your mission pursued? And I would describe strategic philanthropy as an increase in that intensity of production. It basically means your own investment in conceptual thinking, in designing those combinations of alliances and corporations. This kind of work is increasingly important. It's not just making a grant and getting money out of the door. It is what kind of of thinking investment, what kind of conceptual investment, what kind of um, also based on, on scientific evidence, what kind of effort you are making to focus your strategy and to use the best possible knowledge to direct your practical approaches. And I would say the more you are involved in this kind of conceptual thinking, the more you're moving from a pure and simple grant maker to an institution with a broader way of achieving your impact. And if we look at this in a kind of time series chain, we could describe the activities as a value chain approach and say you are starting in some cases by identifying a relevant problem, by putting, by putting the, your hands on a relevant issue that you think society should pay more attention to. And you're then beginning to convene the expertise that is needed to resolve the problem. You're developing a solution in conjunction with a whole range of stakeholders who should be involved in the field. You demonstrate that it works, and you're then concerned with how you get the model sort of disseminated. And I deliberately use the word disseminated rather than scaled, because these processes of spreading the model, of spreading a solution to a societal problem, these processes are frequently identified as highly political processes. It is not the business metaphor of scaling a single organization. It is more of a political metaphor of negotiating coalitions and negotiating allies to get your agenda really implemented in society. Final argument. Take the turn and look at what foundations have been doing from a point of view of what did those do that were evaluated as impactful and successful. And this refers back to, uh, to sort of knowledge on strategic problem solving in society. First of all, there is no general recipe. So what your strategies really do is not implementing cookbook recipes. The core thing is the definition of the problem in the way that you address it. Let me give you an example. If you do a 10,000 euro grant and you say uh, it, is, it is preventing climate change from progressing, this is not specific enough. A 10,000 euro grant will not have any mark on climate change. But if you do 10 million and you, you choose a very specific focus and you conclude that your solution would be creating a think tank that would sort of address public policy and advocate for change, this might be a specific focus as also equivalently resourced and funded. So by an, by an adequate problem definition, we mean that you tailor your specific description of how you perceive the problem also to the needs of your organization and to a specific concept of how you want to address it. And then the question is, to what extent are we dealing with uncertainty here? Because if you are in a very known field of activities, the strategy may be very rational, and we know the vehicles and the instruments and implement them. If we are in a field of high uncertainty, we need to be more experimental in narrowing in the problem. So 
it's an issue of, in successful cases of social innovation, it's an issue of the problem definition, of a coherent design of how to address it, and of allowing for a sufficient degree of experiment in situations of high uncertainty. So those programs in philanthropy that had a demonstrable impact did a few things. They were clearly problem-oriented. They described a clear problem that they wanted to resolve. They tried to reduce the complexity by describing the problem in terms of manageable and relevant components that the foundation would address. They tried to find a tailor-made solution, and they tried to represent a fit of problem intervention players and resources in that approach. Do not ignore a very important stakeholder. Do not use very inappropriate or far too small amounts of resources for a huge problem. In that case, narrow in the problem description, narrow in the, the question that you're addressing. Build coalitions with the appropriate stakeholders around you from the very beginning, and then design the appropriate intervention. We also found that in doing this exercise, you have to deal with two major issues of uncertainty. What can be uncertain in a certain way is on the one hand the level of goals and on the other hand the level of instruments of how you get there. If there is controversy about the goals, in other words, if there is controversy about the driving values of how to address a problem, you have the sort of the columns described in this graph at the top and if the instruments, if the actual technology to approach the problem is uncertain or unknown, you have the lines in this graph. And you see if the goals are uncontroversial, if, if there is agreement about where to go, but it's unknown of how to resolve it, you have the development of social innovations. If the, the, the goals are controversial and the way to the goals is unknown, it is muddling through, what our sort of colleague Lindblom, Charles Lindblom called muddling through. If it is uncontroversial and known, it's strategic philanthropy. And if it's controversial and known, it is this issue of moderation of political situations of advocacy. Now, we can connect this to another piece, um, to another argument, which is who is in control of the situation and how are effective mechanisms of control be in a field? What, what degree of control can a foundation expect to have if there is sort of unknown territory but high degree of control? You can talk of genuine experimenting. If there is low control, it's again muddling through. If it's high control and a known territory, it may be strategic philanthropy. And if you are weak in control, but known in how you're using your instruments, you can use ad hoc interventions. So you see, just beginning to think about what is in agreement, what is in disagreement. Are you in agreement with the other players in the field about the values that are driving a direction of solving a problem? Are you in agreement about the instruments to use on that way? And are you aware of the fact who controls the process? Can decide very much on what approach you would finally want to take. So let me finally conclude by saying there is no cookbook recipe. There is a set of categories that I've been offering to you to reflect about. First of all, think of what you're doing as an investment. It is an investment that you expect to pay back in terms of the solution of societal problems. Think of it in terms of a very clear definition of your role vis-a-vis -vis the state in particular and expressing the independence and the unique assets and opportunities of independent foundations. Think of a careful division of labor with other players that you need to get to your solution. And think of a very clear definition and description of the problem that you really want to address. Do not think of very broad problems with very unspecific approaches, but spend some careful thinking on narrowing it in. And I wish you all possible success in doing the exercise 
I will <laughs> join you for the next decades. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for Herr Dr. Ted? Any questions for him? I mean, there's one that um, stuck out at the beginning. I, I was going to ask you, um, Volker, who's to say that, or how does um, a foundation resist the push, in, particularly in states um, where you have the, the social welfare model that, that is being today, that is actually being deconstructed, and the push then for foundations to take the place of the state and to take the role of the state and to fill in the gaps that are getting bigger by cuts in public spending. I mean, how can a foundation resist the push to basically you know, take the role of what the state used to do? Well, I would, uh, if, you, if you were challenged in that situation as an individual foundation, I think it would be two arguments that would come to the forefront. One is, even if you, were, um, if, if you were interested in taking the role, your resources would still be far too insufficient. And if your resources are too insufficient, you would run the risk of, um, by, by spreading resources too thin, mm -hmm. remaining totally ineffective in anything you could do. Mm -hmm. So if your resources are limited and they cannot take the whole role of the state, it will be particularly important to focus to keep a clear strategic track and to, to play that role that I just tried to outline, mm -hmm. rather than let the foundation be tempted to take the more generic role and in doing so running the risk of being totally ineffective. So I would argue vis-a-vis -vis government, if you really want any success at all, rather than even wasting our re limited resources in the foundation, do allow us to keep focus, to, to use what our assets are good for. That, in, that independence and that opportunity to drive innovation. Is there agreement among, among the audience? Do you, do you see foundations being pushed to pick up and, and take up the slack of what states used to do? Maybe a show of hands, do people see that? Some do. How about people who say no, foundations are not having to do that? Yeah, it's about half and half. Okay. Let me also mention this problem does not just come up in situations of austerity that we have recently right. seen as a consequence of the financial crisis. That situation can also come up in a, a case that I once experienced when a donor came to me for advice and said, I want to create a substantial foundation in my hometown. That person was willing to invest about 100 million euros in endowment and that would have generated a, an annual budget of several million in a city of 20,000 people and he wanted to create a charter that would only focus on that city. And I did all possible arguing to, to convince him that this was not a good decision, because he would basically be blamed for everything that would happen in that city, irrespective of whether it happened or whether right. it didn't happen. Because his, his independent money would be more than any single budget item in the city budget, and so he would basically call upon for everything. So your problem of, of this kind of independence battle can not just occur on a national level and in austerity situations, it is the constant issue of, of, of private independent foundations, I would argue. Okay. Any more que a questions? Right here we've got, yep. Do you have a, do you have a microphone? You have this lady right here. There you go. Yes, so, <coughs> Laura Kopman from Finland. Uh, Professor Besenbacher referred to the PPPs and also the private sector playing a role, more and more, or should be playing a role. Do you have any comments on this based on what you have been speaking of? So you more talked about the public sector now. Well, yes, in most countries we should not ignore that, especially when it comes to research funding, a very large share, the majority share of actual research funding, and it is all the more, the more applied the research is, comes from private sector corporate, corporate backgrounds. Uh, so we should not think of, especially in this context of research funding, think of this context as just a balance between the state and philanthropy. It is, as a matter of fact, the largest share of resources invested in, in, in research and innovation in total is corporate money. And then mm -hmm. the other two players come in. So yes, indeed, but it is an issue of deciding on what level of research you're active, whether you're on a very basic level of, of generic research or whether you're getting closer to applied levels of research. 
which again is part of your positioning. If your uh, overall mission was in the area of uh, addressing um, carbon emissions and reducing those, those climate change um, sort of carbon dioxide emissions, you may be closer to, uh, to sort of levels of applied research. In other contexts, you may be close to very basic levels of research. And we have actually seen at our university 50% uh, partnerships between the corporate world and either foundations or public budgets uh, that we call research on campus and that basically are characterized by corporate research groups and academic research groups working jointly 50% each together on the same issues. Now you may wonder how do we deal with the intellectual property rights? Uh, it is very simple. Um, on certain levels of basic research you are not talking about uh, sort of research that will immediately lead to patents and if it does the corporate players are still viewing it as an advantage to have participated in the research group through direct involvement of their research staff and they're accepting that the results of those joint, joint research groups uh, are, are public domain or are um, sort of patented on, on university grounds and are not private property of that company for the reason of either the total budget being so large that the corporate player in its own right would not be able to afford it or would not have access to the full range of necessary knowledge. So there, there, there is increasingly a level of strategies in which even corporate players are prepared to invest in research in which they will not hold private property mm -hmm. rights as a consequence. I think we had one more question over here. Volker, was there? Right there. Oh, we didn't? Oh, okay. That's all right. Good. Okay. Well, yeah. then, I, yeah. Go ahead. Ask. Yeah. <laughs> Don't I, I be bashful. Give, I yeah. can give testimony. I'm yeah. Lars Holtmann, Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research. Uh, two years ago, the Swedish uh, Research Council decided to drop out to walk out of their industry PhD program. Mm -hmm. Half a year later, my foundation starts such a program. Uh, the irony is that the companies and the university come out on par. Nothing has changed. But the government walked out of one of their duties. Mm. Uh, they didn't carry the money over to one other actor that could take up the duty. Uh, this shows the fragility of, of the system. Um, and of course, as you are presenting, a risk that the foundation will spread, it, spread its resources too thin over too long time. Mm -hmm. But there is a need for strategic actors. Yes. No, that's a good example. Yeah, it's um, a good example and, and um, we haven't seen these in, in our country, we haven't seen these immediate challenges of players walking out. Uh, we see tensions in a different way. With increasing private shares of research funding, the problem is the basic infrastructure of public research institutions. Uh, it has taken years of negotiations until in certain states, because research and higher education in Germany is a state responsibility, not a federal responsibility, even though federal government makes substantial contributions and increasingly it is acknowledged that it will not be possible to sustain the, sy the system without them. But still, it is an issue of direct bargaining between state governments and, and, and higher education institutions, universities, other uh, higher education institutions and research centers. And the, the very success of attracting private resources has basically increased the challenges for infrastructure funding and for core funding of the institutions. And only in a few cases we have managed to negotiate reasonable funding agreements between state government and universities. Our own state in Baden-Württemberg has recently been an example of that, in which it is acknowledged that basically public overhead funding should increase in line with, um, with successful fundraising for private resources because otherwise the core resources of, a, of an institution will be under severe pressure. Mm. Uh, it can even be as, as ironic as to a shortage of capacity in that, in that development department of the university which administers the very grant agreement and is, uh, agreements and is short of legal counsel capacity so that grant agreements are not being processed even though there is an interest on private parts to co-fund and to finance. 
so it is a, a matter of balance and of, of uh, reaching reasonable agreements which will not be able to leave out government. 